The Crypto Markets Update is brought to you by KuCoin, the best place to find the next crypto gem. So markets might be in the red for the start of 22, but 2021 was a very different story for crypto. Uh, and we have a chance now to reflect on the year that was via Coindesk's research annual report, which analyzes the performance and trends for digital assets in 2021 and their implications for 2022. This comprehensive report focuses on Bitcoin, Ethereum, DeFi, NFTs, and more. Research analyst George Kaloudis is here with the highlights and the lowlights. Uh, welcome, George. How's it going, guys? Good morning. Good to see you, man. Hi. So, first of all, like, yeah, we'll, we'll get into sort of how this all is playing out with uh, the current moment. But, um, you know, one of the themes that, that seems to be pretty important is this, um, you know, Bitcoin dominance has declined. The idea that Bitcoin just rules the market uh, with the rise of, of, of relative to it, at least, Ethereum, but some other alts as well. Can you talk through what's going on there? Yeah. We I mean, if you just... Yeah, if you just look at any 2021 annual chart for any crypto project, you'll see that it has gone pretty much parabolic, right? So pretty much everything's up. So the fact that dominance for, of Bitcoin's market cap fell in relation to the rest of the crypto market cap is really unsurprising. And what we show here in this chart on the right is that in 2017, we had about 38% of the market cap was dominated by Bitcoin. In 2021, we're kind of approaching that now with that 40%. The thing that I would say is that we are in a very much of a different crypto market. The 2017 crypto market was decentralizing spaceships, airplanes. It was clearly vaporware and clearly scams. And now, although there are scams in, in the marketplace, it's very much more of a real industry where people are making genuine efforts to build projects up. So it's definitely a different world that we're working in now. So, George, I just want to kind of dig in a little bit to some of the super performers of 2021. And the two that really stand out are Polygon and Solana. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? I mean, just just what happened there and just what I mean, because for both of those, I mean, both of them are the, the two of them are quite different from one another, but they're not the only ones in that space. Right. So what made those two tokens stand out and perform so phenomenally in 2021? Yeah. If I know anything about crypto market investors, there's probably some weird nuanced thing where, oh, they're both purple. We like purple. Purple coins are going to go up. Um, but there is kind of a thread that does tie them together is that it's about scaling. They're both about scaling. So Solana is one of one of the darlings of the year and is backed uh, pretty uh, strongly by Sam Bankman fried of FTX and from the people at Multicoin. So there's, that's a lot of money that was poured into Solana. But the reason Solana got so popular is because Ethereum gas fees were so high that it was difficult to carry out transactions on Ethereum. So people started looking for cheaper alternatives and Solana offered a smart contract platform that was cheaper, right? People were saying, oh, this is free gas, this is free gas. So there was a lot of layer one upside there versus Ethereum where people couldn't afford to even put a transaction in. Um, Similarly, Polygon or Matich, the Polygon's the uh, rebrand, they are also building out three different scaling solutions for Ethereum. They're trying to do optimistic rollups, uh, ZK rollups, and they're working on a side chain. So it's really an Ethereum scaling solution with a token. So the things that are tying this thing together is the scaling problem of uh, smart contract platforms that are trying to be decentralized. The other thing I'd say, and the reason that it went up, you know, 13,000 or 14,000 percent is because they started at really small market caps, right? Solana now is around $50 billion and Polygon's at uh, $15 billion, I think. Uh, they did not start the year as such, right? These were tiny, tiny coins. And then suddenly the network effects kicked in and we saw this crazy return. Yeah, as, speaking of crazy returns, I mean, crypto really outperformed traditional assets, but it came at a price. It came with a lot of volatility, correct? I mean, it, it, you know, one thing I noted in, in, in a previous column that I did was that if you just leveraged your S&P 500 returns, you probably would have mirrored a lot of what Bitcoin would have done if you just leveraged it, let's say, 2x you would have gotten the same returns in 2021. So can you, can you talk a little bit about what, what's going on here? I mean, we're, we're seeing just this massive outperformance in crypto this past year compared to traditional assets. Yeah, Lawrence, I'll raise you one on that one. If you just held Apple stock last year, you probably would have just performed just as well if you held Bitcoin spot. So there is something to be said there about, you know, you could probably have made more money in the equity markets if, if you uh, only held Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, 
it, we are out, we outperformed last year. Bitcoin is up 60%. Ethereum is up 400%. But S&P still did rip. I mean, it was up 25% and gold and bonds are down. So we're clearly we're in, we're in what I would say is a, an environment where people are moving out on the risk curve, right? We've been talking about this for a really long time. And retail's injection into the markets, along with you know unprecedented economic stimulus and money printing, led to us to a period where everyone wants to take risks. So it's really not surprising to me that Bitcoin and Ethereum are up so much, and also the S and P. Um, you're getting a lot more volatility with Bitcoin and Ethereum and your favorite dog token. Um, so that's the risk you take there. But yeah, with and, volatility you, you comes know, returns. You know, along those lines, I mean, what, what you're saying about gold is that we, it did go down in 2021. And, and there has been this narrative about inflation hedge, and yet you did see this extra risk taken on. So, so the whole narrative of Bitcoin being the inflation hedge, it didn't quite play out, correct? Yeah, I don't, I don't even know if Bitcoin knows what it wants to be because you have a, such a large, uh, such disparate subsets of groups who like Bitcoin for various reasons, right? A lot of people are saying it is the inflation, inflation hedge. A lot of people are saying it's gold 2.0. A lot of people are saying it's just going to destabilize the entire monetary system and it's going to spiral us into chaos. Other people are saying it's going to replace cash, right? And it's going to be sort of this parallel universe where we can, you know, pay with Bitcoin. I don't think Bitcoin's old enough to really know what it is. And I think calling it inflation hedge now is premature. It's an aspirational store of value in inflation hedge. How about that? That's good. But George, the story has gotten a lot wider than Bitcoin this past year, right? I mean, in, you know, largely Ethereum, but also based on these other Ethereum competitor blockchains, we've seen an explosion yeah. of, of different uh, use cases, NFTs, DeFi, et cetera. You know, what do, what do you make of that theme? Yeah, uh, I, I sort of uh, hinted at that when I answered Emily's question about Polygon and uh, Solana is that a lot of the new use cases that are coming up are new layer one con uh, smart contract platforms, right? They're trying to scale these layer ones and make them cheaper and make them more affordable, make them more accessible. And really, that's powering the NFT boom that we've saw the past year. A lot of people heard about Ethereum because of NFTs, not the other way around. A lot of thing, people, things that people are building are also, you know, algorithmic stable coins. All those, those projects are still pretty early. People are trying to build, you know, EVM bridges that bridge from one uh, chain to another chain. So we can have, you know, this internet of blockchains. Uh, but all that said, my favorite use case, and it's probably unsurprising to people who know who I am, is that Lightning, right? The Lightning Network is what powers Bitcoin's commerce layer. And people are talking about how Bitcoin transaction fees are far too high to enable casual commerce. And I tend to agree. And so to that, people have built a second layer on top of uh, Bitcoin called the Lightning Network, which allows cheap instantaneous transactions. Uh, that's my favorite use case of the year. I think it's actually one of the, somehow, it, it, be, I think because it's such a small country that uh, uh, got, uh, sorry, I'm El losing Salvador. the word here, yep. but El Salvador, El thank Salvador. you, El Salvador. I couldn't think of the country, I can't believe that. El, <laughs> that's actually country. probably, that's exactly the point there, right? I forgot, and I spend all my, my time looking at this every day, is that Bitcoin became legal tender in a country, right? But it's El Salvador, it's a small country. But I think it's a big deal, and, and clearly the people in the space think it's a big deal as well, because we saw the amount of Bitcoin locked up in the Lightning Network go from about 1,000 to 3,000 Bitcoin. And I think that was spurred on by El Salvador and by people who love Bitcoin trying to build out this use case. Uh, George, let's talk a little bit about hash rate. Um, so one of the huge stories of 2021 was China. Well, China's crackdown is kind of a continuous story, but China cracked down even more and they cracked down on mining pretty seriously. And so we basically saw hash rate migrate from China to other parts of the world, specifically the U.S. Can you just talk to us a little bit about the hash rate narrative of 2021? Yeah, so China's hit us with, I don't know, the fifth or sixth crypto ban, uh, widespread crypto ban in May of this year, or of 2021, sorry, last year. And it was the first time where it felt real, right? We actually saw hash rate fall from about 150 exahashes to 90 over the period of like two or three weeks. Uh, and everyone was actually, there was a sort of a, a doomsday mentality from a lot of people that were saying that, oh my goodness, this is coming offline and Bitcoin's going to death spiral into zero. Uh, there were people that claimed that people were going to be moving miners from China over uh, to the West, right, to the US. And that was uh, 
fleshed out over you know the past couple of months because we recovered all of that ha lost hash rate. We actually hit an all-time high by the end of the year at 189 exahashes, and all of the hash rate that was in China, presumably all, left, and it ended up going into the United States, into Russia, and into Kazakhstan. Uh, those are the three big places that it flew, uh, flowed into. So. Uh, getting back a little bit to what you were saying earlier about, uh, you know, you, you, you called the 2017, 2018, a, a period of scams, but in, in many ways, those ICOs that, that happened were a way for, for these projects to get funded. But what's interesting is this year, you're seeing a lot more funding happening, uh, from let's say VCs, private equity, et cetera. Uh, what does that tell us? What, what do we see? This was a lot of money, correct? Yeah, it's a lot of money. And the fact that we saw over $20 billion of VC capital flowing into these types of companies in 2021, that exceeded uh, 2017 through 2020 in totality. That's crazy. And we're seeing like real, I say real, because you know how that uh, is viewed in this space, but real money flowed into the space, right? We have name brand venture capital firms, A16Z being sort of the, the stalwart of it pouring money into these projects because they want to make a return, but also because they think that it has staying power, right? Uh, you see regulators in the, in the Congress are talking about crypto. Crypto is here to stay. And now the fact that people have poured all this money, this VC money in means that there's now an economic incentive, even more so than there was before to, to carry this on going forward, right? At least in the medium term, right? Before it was, you know, retail investors are, were getting uh, screwed, right? They were losing all their money. Now it's big VC institutions with LPs that are insurance funds and or whatever they may be. So there's real money at stake now. Well, uh, so much for this uh, a brilliant 2021, uh, George. 2022 isn't looking quite so optimistic. Um, you know, and so let's just talk a little bit about that. Like, I, I, I think the Kazakhstan story to me is a really interesting one because one of the positive takeaways that people had from the way that the hash rate recovered from you know China's uh, departure and the, the, the exit of all the miners and seeking out these different locations was that we would have a more decentralized, less sort of geopolitically vulnerable Bitcoin network because you didn't have this big you know authoritarian state that could sort of you know pull the rug on everybody. Um, well, you know, yesterday we had a huge chunk, it looks like at least, of, of Kazakh's uh, mining capacity go down because of an internet outage that was driven by a political response to, uh, uh, you know, the, the rioting and the insurrection there. Um, so can you speak to that? Like, you know, can we be as confident as we were a little while ago that we'd created a more decentralized Bitcoin network? Um, in 2021 with that sort of migration into the U.S. and all those other locations out of China. Yeah, and to hedge against myself sounding tone deaf, I think that Bitcoin mining is not the most important thing that's happening right now in Kazakhstan. People rioting for their rights is actually a far different thing. It's outside the scope of what Bitcoin really should be right now, right? Energy prices going up, that's a big problem beyond just Bitcoin. Uh, but to your point, the fact that it flowed into Kazakhstan is something that uh, hash rate flowing into Kazakhstan was something that when it first happened, actually worried me a little bit, right? This wasn't exactly the United States, right? The free world. And they did use a lot of coal uh, energy. That's sort of the grid that is in Kazakhstan. The And that, it sounds like I'm shirking the answer to your, to your question, but miners just moved from China. They can move somewhere else. And I think they will. Right. Honestly, uh, being within the confines of a Kazakhstan regula regulatory environment, if it's even an environment, I know very much about it, but it's very different than being the U.S., yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. The the fact that like there was that flexibility that they had last year could now apply now, right? There's there's that we did what yep. the one takeaway really in that sense was that. But of course, lots of other factors in play in Bitcoin. We'd love to get into sometime. You know, the Fed's impact, of course, overnight a really big deal yesterday, and and what that means for the outlook for Bitcoin.